Here's the first video in a three-part lesson on something known as the Helmholtz coil. And you've seen the Helmholtz coil before. There was a demonstration that was done in class where um, we used a tube that had a cathode in it. And the cathode shot electrons. But then these two coils that you can see here, that coil and that coil produced a nearly uniform magnetic field and so when the electrons were trying to move through the magnetic field they ended up experiencing a centripetal force and the electrons moved in a circle they interacted um, somewhat with the gas inside of the tube and the gas gave off a greenish glow in this picture uh, they, they must have used a different gas in this picture of it and it gives off a purplish glow but hopefully you remember that demonstration in any case these two coils of wire that were used to produce the magnetic field that made the electrons follow the curved path form what's known as a Helmholtz coil. So in this first part of the lesson, I just want to uh, start by reminding you what the magnetic field is at the center of a single loop, okay? So let's picture a single loop of wire. And we'll say current flows in this direction and continues around clockwise. and We make a little DS. I'm trying to find the magnetic field at the center. So there's a distance of r and a vector of r hat. And law of Bios of r says a little bit of magnetism just from this ds can add with the magnetism from that ds and that ds and so on. But any given uh, ds produces magnetic field at the center equal to mu naught over 4 pi times the integral of I ds cross r hat divided by r squared. Well, every one of these ds has the same value of r, and the angle between the ds and the r hat is 90 degrees. So this simplifies, and if you need to review the video where we did this the first time, uh, you're welcome to go back and play that at this point if you want to hit pause and come back, or I can just give you the result. The magnetic field at the center of a single loop is equal to mu naught I divided by 2r. And in that same earlier video, we said, well, if it doesn't form a complete circle, if it's just a, sorry, if it's just a fraction of a loop that subtends some angle of theta, then it's b equals mu naught i over 4 pi r times theta. Okay, so here's a new question. What if we take the loop and we turn it on its side. What if the loop is in this orientation and we're trying to find the magnetic field at this point P right here? So it's not going to be quite as strong as it is at the center, but we should be able to figure this out. If the current flows in this way and goes around, oh, maybe an eyeball is looking in this direction, I guess we would then say this eyeball says the current is going around that loop counterclockwise. There's a DS here that points into the page, and a DS here that points up, and a DS here that points out of the page. So it's uh, somewhat of a three-dimensional drawing here. Maybe I can draw that better if I have you take a look at this diagram, and there's the same axis x-axis that I was trying to represent, and then the y-axis and the z-axis. Okay, so we're trying to find the magnetic field at this point p. Now let's take a look at all these vectors that are shown here. Yeah, r is the distance from some chosen of ds or dl, same thing, I'll choose ds. Here they're saying that this loop of wire has a radius of a, I'll use capital R. And then, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Well, I'm going to call this angle right here phi. So what's this all about? Well, the little bit of magnetism at this point is due to the current flowing through this segment ds. So let's express law b o sub r. The magnitude of that bit of magnetic field is mu naught um, over 4 pi times i, and then the cross product of ds and r hat, all divided by r squared. So let's focus on what the direction of ds cross r hat would be. So we've got um, 
a length r, let me highlight a little better here so you can see it, that's r hat. That's a vector one unit long that lies in the xy plane. Okay, it's not, it's not parallel to x, and it's not exactly parallel to y, but it is in the xy plane, whereas ds is entirely on the z-axis. So the angle between ds and r hat is an angle of 90 degrees. Let me see if I can draw that a little better. So same sort of three-dimensional drawing, and this ds we're showing up here would be coming kind of out of the page, so to speak, right? So that's perpendicular to the plane of the page, whereas r hat is in the plane of the page. So the angle between them is 90 degrees, which means ds cross r hat is just equal to ds times r hat, but r hat is 1. So the magnitude of ds cross r hat is just ds. It's the direction we're interested in, right? So there's a right-hand rule for finding cross products. If you have a vector that points out of the page and you rotate that into a vector that lies in the xy plane at this angle, then you should agree the result is a cross product that points this way. If ds is out of the page, r is in the plane of the page, then ds cross r hat points also in the plane of the page, in the xy plane at this angle. So if I call this phi, and this is 90 degrees, so this angle over here would be 90 minus phi. Okay, there we go. So the magnetic field at this point has a component that points down the x-axis, and it has a component that points up the y-axis. Now, how about this? The current is flowing this way, and down here at the bottom is a ds that points into the page. And then we have the distance r, we have the unit vector um, r hat, and if we take the cross product of ds cross r hat for that element, then we're going to find that its magnetic field points this way. And that angle is 90 degrees, and this is also 90 minus phi. And so the end result is that all of the y components to the magnetic field cancel out, and so the net magnetic field at the point in question is really just the overall sum of the x components. So the total magnetic field at the point in question can be found not just by summing up db, but by summing up db subscript x. So let's go back. Maybe this diagram is a little better looking. Clean it up some. OK, right? So the point is, all of those components are going to cancel out, and all you're left with are these components that are going to add up. So we could almost like say, for that ds, and for that ds, you're going to get a bunch of these vectors db that end up in a way, if you can picture this in three dimensions, tracing out something like this, it would be like a cone shape, right? and all of the y components cancel out and you're just left with components in that direction. Okay, so we have a vector db with a component db subscript x and a component db subscript y and an angle right here of 90 minus phi. So db subscript x should be db times the cosine of 90 minus phi, but the cosine of 90 minus phi is the same thing as the sine of phi. So if we call this angle right here phi, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so the sine of phi should be r opposite over hypotenuse, right? 
big R over little r. So this is the same thing as the integral of dB sine of phi, which in turn is the same thing as the integral of dB big R over little r. All right. So we get mu naught i over 4 pi ds cross r hat over r squared times r over r. We're trying to sum up all of that. So constants, okay, mu naught. Um, what else? Well, the amount of current that's flowing through this loop is the same amount of current for any one of these ds. So current's a constant. That comes out of the integral. 4 pi. Ooh, how about this? How does the distance from this ds, which we've labeled as r, compare to the distance from this ds to the point in question? Isn't that the same value r? So all of the r's are constants. Oh, OK. This isn't nearly as bad as it looked at first. We get b is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi capital R over lowercase r cubed, all constants. And then we're left with the integral of ds cross r hat, but we stated earlier that just gives us the integral of ds times r hat times sine of, mm, careful, not times the sine of phi. The angle here we're talking about is the angle between the ds and the r hat, which is an angle of 90 degrees. So times sine of 90. Well, that's 1. That's 1. So it's just the integral of ds, which means I have to add up all of the little bits of path length around the loop, but that's just going to give me the circumference of this loop, which would be 2 pi times capital R. So we've got it. The magnetic field at the point along the central axis of a loop of wire is equal to mu naught i times 2 pi, let's see, 2 pi r, and this r gives me a 2 pi r squared divided by 4 pi little r cubed cancel the pi. Let's simplify this a little bit. B equals mu naught i r squared over 2. Let's see, what could I substitute for r? I could use Pythagorean theorem. Here's a right triangle. So we've got r. Clean this up once again. R is the hypotenuse. X is the adjacent side to this angle phi. And then the opposite side is capital R. So I believe R is equal to the square root of X squared plus capital R squared. So we can replace R cubed with X squared plus R squared to the 3 halves. Now, by the way, if we took that loop of wire and wound it around once, twice, three, four, five, any number of turns, then we can say n represents the number of windings. And then each winding would just add more and more to the overall magnetic field. So we can say for a coil of n turns or n windings, the magnetic field, not so much at the center, but the magnetic field at some point P, a distance x away from the center, would be equal to n mu naught i r squared over 2 x squared plus r squared to the 3 halves, where capital R represents the radius of that uh, loop. 
Okay, so we're going to use this result in uh, video number two of this three-part lesson.